Howdy, everybody, and welcome to Senator John Hickenlooper's virtual town hall. I'm Shad Mira, Hicks State Director, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we want to use as much time as we can for Senator Hickenlooper to answer your questions. So just a few short housekeeping items and then we'll get started. Uh, so many of you have already submitted questions ahead of time on our website. And for those of you who haven't, if you're watching this town hall on YouTube, then you can enter your question directly into the comment section. If you're following along on Facebook, submit your question in the comments. And we're also keeping an eye on our Twitter account. So just tag at Senator Hick in your tweet and I hope we'll be able to get to your question. Uh, so we obviously want to get to as many questions as we can, uh, but please bear with us as we're already receiving quite a few. Um, if we aren't going to get to your question or unable to get to your question tonight, you can always contact the Senator in our office by phone or email. Uh, you can find contact details to get in touch with Senator Hickenlooper on our website at hickenlooper.senate.gov. So without further ado, I'm going to go and turn it over to the Senator for a few opening remarks and then we'll get started. Great. Thank you, Shad. Um, and thank the whole team who's helped put this together. And thank all of you that are viewing. I'm going to make this the shortest introductions because I think these are best with just the questions and, and the answers. I do want to recognize the, the 13 service members killed in Afghanistan. Um, I think it weighs heavily on all of our hearts. Um, our thoughts are with their families and the last of American troops left today. So this is this is so ends our our longest war, uh, and I know I know we've we've had this in our in our thoughts all these last couple of weeks. I uh, also want to thank so many of you sent me well wishes when I had uh, Robin and I both had uh, COVID nineteen. Um, we were lucky; we were both vaccinated. Uh, it meant that we had a very mild case. Although I'm still a little tired at the end of the day. Um, it's unclear whether that might just be partially old age catching up to me, um, but it's it's been a great six months. Uh, I'm not sure what it says about me as a person or as a human being, but I do love being in the Senate. And I think there's a lot of good things we can get done. Michael Bennett has been a great mentor and, and really helped explain the rope, ropes. He is one of the most respected senators. Uh, and by that, I mean respected by the other senators uh, in either party. And he has the respect of people of both parties. So anyway, so much for my introduction. Uh, I am delighted to be in the Senate and I look forward to, to being your voice. And this town hall is just one of many that we will uh, utilize and hopefully eventually in person uh, and be able, be able to uh, uh, hear from you what, what, what your priorities are and what your concerns are. Okay. So Shad, let's kick it off. Perfect. Thank you, Senator. So the first question is from Susan in Grand Junction. Susan asks, we're seeing the results of climate change firsthand here in Colorado. Our temperatures in much of the Western Slope have already exceeded the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming temperature target, and we're experiencing a 22 year mega drought. What are your climate solution priorities for the reconciliation bill? And will carbon pricing be included in that bill? Okay, so we're gonna start off with the hard questions first. Um, I mean, climate is the the existential challenge of of our lives, um, and every report that we get shows that climate change is accelerating faster than than was previously believed. And whether you're looking at hurricanes hitting New Orleans or wildfires burning out of control across the Western United States, there's evidence of climate change and the extreme weather that that comes along with that. Uh, everywhere. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which I spent a lot of time on, I was, you know, one of the, in the end it was 22, uh, we called it the G22, but both 11 Republicans and 11 Democrats who worked very hard to try and find the appropriate compromises. Uh, and we're going to have, you know, some big investments there. We're going to have some of the largest investments in electrification in this country to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. Um, there'll be uh, seven and a half billion dollars to, to really build, begin building out the uh, electric vehicle recharging stations. Uh, we'll spend $21 billion to clean up all the pollution that has been you know, part of, of our need that, but been ignored now for, for several decades. Um, uh, and in terms of resiliency, there'll be $43 billion 
in various forms of that. There's also $65 billion, or I take that back, $73 billion um, that will be in, invested in uh, the grid. Uh, and a big part, if we're going to have more wind and more solar energy, a big part of is making sure that we can get that energy where where it's generated and where it's where you know we can use clean uh, energy to create electricity. We need to get that electricity to where we need it. So uh, I think that that's a big part of what we're we're focused on this. And obviously, the the thing I like more than anything would be to get a a price on carbon in the uh, in this this bipartisan bill, the infrastructure bill. Just because it's everything else we do around climate change is it's not superfluous, but it's, it it would all be orchestrated it'd be so much less expensive, so much more efficient uh, if there was some sort of a fee and a dividend of some sort that would allow us to incentivize and motivate all these entrepreneurs all over the country, not just Colorado, but all over the country, to motivate these entrepreneurs to find cleaner ways of delivering energy and, and and more efficient ways of using the energy we have. So I'm not sure we're going to get that in the, into the reconciliation, into the, um, uh, we couldn't get it into the infrastructure bill, I don't think. Uh, just weren't able to do it. But I think there's ways we can get it into reconciliation. Um, so we'll see. That's a, it's, if you don't think about it and you don't at least have that that dream, then you're never going to get it. That's right. Got a big fight ahead of us. Um, thanks, Senator, for that one. Uh, kind of segueing from your comments on infrastructure, we actually just got a comment on that from Barbara in Denver. And she asks, with the new infrastructure bill being passed, how will that affect Colorado and what can we expect to gain regarding repairs, et cetera, from the bill? So the bill is not passed yet. And I think that's fair to, you know, we got to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, <clears throat> but as based on, on, previous federal formulas, about $3.7 billion for uh, federal aid for highway apportioned, apportioned uh, projects, <clears throat> something like, two, it's over 200, I think $225 million for bridges. Uh, broadband, our allocation would be a minimum of $100 million, which I think in this state will go a long way. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm <clears throat> it's the end of a long day. The, the fatigue will catch up to me before we're done here, I'm sure. Um, also within that, 22% uh, of the people in Colorado are eligible for the uh, affordability connectivity benefit, which will help low income, low income families afford uh, getting on the internet. Uh, and that's over 1.2 million Coloradans or 22% of our population. Um, there's also money for uh, public, uh, public transportation, almost a uh, uh, billion dollars in Colorado. Uh, and as I said before, these electric vehicle um, uh, charging networks, <clears throat> when you put all that in uh, within the infrastructure as well, you get you get over fifty seven um, uh, million dollars in Colorado. So that's the the kind of thumbnail sketch. Uh, the key, I think, assuming that we pass both the inf infrastructure bill and the and the reconciliation, we will we will deliver more. Uh, more resources to fight climate change than at any time in the history of 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 the earth. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. In the history, in history, we we never put a greater focus on dealing with this. And you know, even then, I feel like I I still feel we need more. Thanks, Senator. Appreciate that. Um, our next question comes from Alan from Castle Pines um, on Space Command. And he asked, why hasn't President Biden canceled uh, President Trump's decision to transfer Space Command to Alabama? Why hasn't this decision been overturned? <laughs> you know, um, it's amazing, right? It's amazing that, that President Trump can come out and say <clears throat> that this decision was made strictly for political purposes. It was just uh, he made the decision himself uh, for whatever reasons he thought. Um, he would, I guess, he wouldn't say political purposes, but he certainly, clearly, stated that the process that our military uses to uh, to make these kinds of decisions, and again, this is very important to have a stable democracy, is to make sure that 
the, the decisions made by our government are not to benefit one state or another or one person or another based on some political promise or you know, political expectation that we are always trying to get the best solution for our country. Um, and last week, uh, General Raymond announced that the command, uh, the initial, uh, initial operational capacity uh, has been achieved. Uh, and I think we're going to see over these next couple of years that Colorado Springs is is already set up to be the 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 home of Space Command and and moving it to to a, a city in in Alabama not only would cost billions of dollars and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars anyway and probably over a billion dollars uh, but it would distract you know many of the most important people. Uh, issues around space, our, our defense uh, of of space, uh, it would it would distract people who you know have better uses for their time and higher priorities. So there are two Department of Defense investigations uh, going on, uh, Inspector General and the uh, GAO. Uh, let's let these investigations go forward. Uh, they will um, ferret out the facts, and let's just make sure that we that it was done properly. I am convinced if we go back. And 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 follow the terms that were originally defined to make this decision. That Colorado Springs will be by far the best location for Space Command. So 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 far, again, we've got to go through the process, and we've got to really maintain the integrity of how our military makes these decisions. It's very very important. Got it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, there's a question from MC Willick here on the screen uh, from social media. It says, is there any plan for public investment in renewable energy installations in rural Colorado to help displace fossil fuel jobs and provide safer, cleaner, and more sustainable economic development? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the commitment to uh, addressing climate change has to be rural and urban. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's interesting. I've, I've spent a bunch of time on some of the uh, wind farms on the Eastern Plains, and they become an important part of, of a county's financial stability, not to mention providing critical additional resources for uh, a lot of our dryland farms that don't have uh, irrigation even in wet years. Uh, so they never are going to be as successful. They're not going to be able to grow the same amount of crops as an irrigated farm. Uh, but with a wind farm, it's amazing. That is a, 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 a crucial bit of additional revenue for them. Um, I think also the uh, some of the money that we're going to spend uh, to clean up the mess that we had made before uh, within the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, there's going to be money to, to deal with all the orphaned oil wells. And as many of you have pointed out to me uh, over these many years, uh, Colorado is no different than any other state, whether it's Oklahoma or or uh, Wyoming, uh, Montana, we have a lot of orphan wells and there'll be about $4.7 billion uh, going towards orphan wells and another $14 billion uh, to clean up uh, abandoned coal mines. And to a certain extent, part of the, the, the job creation that, that we have to undergo is to you know, address some of these problems we've ignored for generations and some of the, the polluted uh, water systems that have been as a, a consequence of uh, mining or oil and gas, other extraction industries. Uh, and this, as we have less jobs in extraction industries, uh, this is gonna be a part of, of how we create those uh, jobs in rural areas. There are gonna be an awful lot of, uh, of skilled jobs that are gonna be well compensated to really adequately address the pollution that's been in place for uh, a long time. Uh, and I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out that we're seeing more and more investments in outdoor recreation, uh, and especially in a state like Colorado that is so well renowned for just the quality of our landscapes and you know the beauty of our trails. Our, our big challenge, I think, is going to be to make sure that we don't overuse those trails, and and you know we have to make sure that as more people. Uh, embrace outdoor recreation, which is a good thing, that they understand what the rules of the road are. The, you know, you, you try to always make uh, our our wilderness 
better than you found it and make sure that we leave every uh, anything that we bring into the forest we take out uh, and that we don't you know <laughs> we we leave it better than than what we found it and I know most Coloradans do that without even thinking about it but it was so many new people coming in we got to make sure that 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 culture is ex is is extended to the next generation it's all part of again making sure that we have sustainable uh, industries all, across the, all parts of the state. Thanks, Senator. A great way to look at every issue. Um, so we have uh, many uh, questions, excuse me, that are submitted via video. But before we go to our first video question, I just want to put in another plug for if you have questions, uh, please uh, put them in the comments if you're watching on social media, whether YouTube or Facebook, or, or tag us on Twitter, at Senator Hick, and uh, we'll hopefully take some more questions from social media. Um, but without further ado, we are actually going to move on to our first video question from Laura from the Colorado Immigrant Rights Coalition. Senator, Senator Kiko Luper, do you believe that opening a path to citizenship for DACA recipients like myself and other essential workers would impact positively our state of Colorado? Um, absolutely. I mean, that's that's an easy question. and. So many of the the DACA recipients, the Dreamers, uh, have become important parts of our community uh, and are involved in essential jobs and 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 making Colorado the the home that that we love. Uh, that's an easy one. I do think we're at a unique place right now in history, uh, and and I'm not a parliamentarian, so I can't say what gets through. But there are. A, a, a lot. There's a lot of talk about trying to use the reconciliation process to address uh, the, the DACA recipients, the, uh, uh, the individuals who have temporary uh, protected status uh, (TPS). You know, they came after a tornado or a hurricane or some problem in their their home country. Uh, there's a, there's there there might be a way to uh, create a pathway to citizenship for these individuals. Uh, through the reconciliation process. But I'd go a step beyond that. And I, again, <laughs> in Washington, it's, it's funny. So pe people are so frustrated by immigration, they kind of given up on, on us ever achieving a, a, a comprehensive uh, immigration reform package. But we've never needed workers more than we do now. We understand that, uh, that, uh, our immigrant community is a is a crucial part of our country, and that having you know two two different standards just doesn't make sense. And I I feel that there's this is a golden time to sit down with Republicans and Democrats and say, all right, so you want to make sure we secure the border? We'll secure the border. We'll make sure we have sufficient infrastructure there to process uh, uh, people applying for refugee status that they can. Uh, do so in a, in a, in a proper and appropriate environment. Uh, we go through all those investments on the, on, the, uh, on the border, but we also make sure that we recognize and deliver, uh, you know, a, a guest worker system that works. And by that, I mean, it protects American workers. Uh, you know, one of the big reasons we've had so much bitterness around immigration is so many Coloradans, so many Americans feel that their job, their work is threatened, that they'll get paid less because of the immigrants that are here in the country now. And I think there's a that's a big part of why at some point we need to control the flow and have a border process that makes sense. Uh, but assuming that we can do that and protect American workers uh, and, and hold all of ourselves accountable not to pay people under the table because that just, you know, when, when people are getting paid under the table and, and, and businesses are paying under the table, that's short circuits how an economy is supposed to work, how, you know, fair business practices are supposed to operate. And I, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. I keep every meeting I'm into around immigration, I keep saying, well, what about trying to look at at least what a, a, an, a an integrated solution to the, to the whole problem would look like. And, and some people are interested still in talking about it. We'll see. <laughs> Thanks so much, Senator. Um, next question is from Grant from Evergreen on Afghanistan. So he asks, 
What specifically has your office done to assist American citizens and SIV holders to get out of Afghanistan? <clears throat> so um, we have a whole team of people that um, address uh, the issues around uh, refugees and immigrants and certainly uh, with all the turmoil <clears throat> in Afghanistan, we're going to see an, an increase in that for sure. <clears throat> we, we know that roughly, you know, 2%, maybe a little more <clears throat> of immigrants to our country end up in Colorado. And it's a relatively small number, uh, but we expect that percentage to stay relatively the same uh, with immigrants coming from Af Afghanistan. Uh, I personally believe very strongly that the Afghanis who embraced us and embraced our values, our our economic system, that they that that those who risked their lives on our behalf in partnership with us, uh, that they deserve our support, and we should do everything we can to uh, get them out of the country to make sure that um, to make to make sure that they are. Uh, going to have a chance to, to create a new life for themselves. I mean, again, they risked their lives for us. In, in many cases, family members gave their lives for the American effort. Um, and I think there are no, a number of nonprofits that are here in Colorado, uh, Project Worthmore, uh, International Rescue Committee. <clears throat> They're doing great work to make sure that these, <clears throat> these refugees, when they come into our state, they know where they can get an apartment. They know you know what the what the public school system looks like. They know how to begin to integrate, how to how to fill out a, a job application, how to make sure that they've got the right uh, documentation. Um, our offices spent a tremendous amount of time with uh, visas uh, for uh, people applying for uh, as uh, Afghani or uh, Afghan refugees. Uh, we also spent a tremendous amount of time uh, getting visas and pass or not visas but passports. Uh, for Americans who are trying to get out of uh, Kabul. Um, and if anybody's, I've got a number here. Let's see, it's on the screen somewhere. The uh, Our casework team can elevate any SIVs or other applications. Uh, you can just call this number, 303-244-1628. And I'll read it together again, 303-244-1628. Or you can send an email to casework at hickenlooper.senate.gov. Um, and I think we've had <clears throat> we've had some notable successes, um, but there are literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that have come to either our office or, or Senator Bennett's office or our congressional offices. And I think the key here is we're all working together to try and 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 deal with this as as quickly and effectively and efficiently as we possibly can. It's, these are obviously very trying times. Thanks, Senator. Um, the next question comes from Scott from Erie, and he asks, what have been your key accomplishments for Colorado this year? Um, you know, I hate those lists uh, <clears throat> of, here's what, you know, you're supposed to beat your chest and say, here's what I did. Um, I thought the, the American Rescue Plan was a big deal. Um, uh, in it, one of the things that Senator Bennett really worked on hard, uh, the child tax credit, and you know, by dramatically increasing that, uh, we really have the opportunity to significantly reduce childhood poverty in this country. We're, if you rank us in among the nations of the world, we're about, I think, 32nd or 34th in, in terms of the percentage of our of our children that live in poverty. Uh, and this could reduce it by, by 50%. Um, I thought the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, I was just so proud to be a part of that and, and to be in meetings one after another where Republicans and Democrats who disagree on a number of, of specifics would take the time to, to figure out what are the things we share. What are the values we're, 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 we're both committed to that all of us, all 22 of us in the room, at, 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 if I don't think we were all 22 at one time, but mo many meetings were 18 or 20 people. <clears throat> and, you know, you began to see how you get to compromise. And, and it has a lot to do with listening. 
and not assuming you've got the right answer and really trying to hear what the other person is saying, what they're what they're suggesting. Uh, and I think that if, that infrastructure bill is going to be the largest, the the largest investment in in uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure, since the New Deal, since since Franklin Roosevelt. And you know, between that bipartisanship bill and the and the reconciliation, uh, since that bipartisan infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill that's still to come. Uh, we're going to create millions and millions of of, of good jobs in this country, uh, and I think we will generate economic growth that's going to help us pay down the debt that we've taken on. Um, so anyway, I think that 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 bipartisan process and and, and the infrastructure bill itself, uh, we've still got to get it past the House, but I think that was uh, it was it was time I really felt where I was adding value. Uh, uh, on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, our act obviously takes four crucial components uh, on the West Slope, and it's noteworthy uh, in, among many states in that we had so many of the county commissioners, Republicans and Democrats, that supported the acreage being set aside and protected in their county. Uh, and historically, this has often had a chance to devolve into a, a more partisan uh, situation. And you know, we. We've avoided that. Uh, again, I think the uh, my predecessor, Mark Udall and Michael Bennett, uh, they spent a lot of time uh, building what has become the core act. and uh, it's I think I think it's a great contribution. I think we're going to get it passed. Uh, last thing I'd say, uh, we had a very good meeting with Secretary Deb Holland uh, in in Grand Junction and and then we did a kind of a, a tour. We were in Palisade the night before. She came into some of the little small towns and she stayed three hours. I mean, I can't remember the last time a cabinet secretary went to towns like Palisade or Montrose and, and really put in the time, really committed themselves uh, and made the investment of their selves there. And we continue to work with uh, Secretary Holland on the, you know, what the future holds for the BLM uh, and the, the headquarters that was it never really got quite moved to to Grand Junction, but I, you know, and I've said this from the beginning, that's a good idea to get those, especially outdoor recreation type jobs, BLM jobs, ranching jobs, you know, jobs that affect rural Colorado. Let's get more of those jobs out of Washington, and 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 get a, a headquarters or some sort of a headquarters um, in Grand Junction, and and have that be the 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 springboard into the rest of the West, and make sure that. Our Western voices are are part and parcel of the information that's used to make the important decisions that the BLM makes. Um, and I think that visit that uh, that Secretary Holland had, and again, I can't remember the last time a, 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 a cabinet secretary spent three days in our state. Never, to my knowledge, in my lifetime. Although maybe there's something I missed, but it, it's just it really de it 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 demonstrated a real uh, an interest uh and a commitment from from the secretary and again she's she's from new mexico so she understands our western values and that we do look at things a little bit differently uh and that we do see a big future for outdoor recreation but we also hunting and fishing and traditional ranching and farming these are all important to us so that i can't overstate how well i thought that visit went and i was so grateful that you know when i first was asking her during a confirmation hearing uh, and I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck, but when I asked her, you know, are you willing to commit to coming to visit uh, Colorado early in your tenure once you're approved as Secretary of the Interior? Um, and Ms. Holland uh, was didn't hesitate for a moment. She said, "Yep, I'm, I'll get out there, you know, early in my in my first year." And, and she did it. So we'll see. We're, we're, we're continuing to have frequent conversations with her office. I know Michael Bennett is as well. Um, and uh, again, you never want to count your chickens. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways that this could get derailed. But I, I feel we're making real progress in, in trying to find a good solution. You're here. It was great to have Secretary Holland here. Um, okay, Senator, the next question is from Social, I believe, YouTube on the Restaurant Relief Fund, and it is, what is the status of the Restaurant Relief Fund? Yeah, um, 
So the restaurant relief fund uh, has uh, was oversubscribed almost immediately. Uh, it's been a, again the COVID, I think, hit restaurants and and other businesses as well, uh, beauty salons and, and barber shops. But th these types of service industries got really hard hit, and I think the uh, the you know, making sure that we had resources to help, help uh, support restaurants going through their, where they're going through their worst hard times. And, you know, even when they've, um, as they're coming out, as we're, as we're you know, uh, before this Delta variant, but we were beginning to get back into the habit of going out to restaurants and, and enjoying our, our friends and neighbors, uh, then they couldn't find enough employees. And, you know, study after study, demonstrated that uh, the real problem the you know, some cases, but I think it was like 10% or 12%, uh, it was the extended unemployment uh, benefits. But in the vast majority of the cases, I think what we saw was uh, again and again, we saw that uh, people who'd been in the restaurant industry were looking at other industries and they were feeling, well, I've done that for a while, now maybe I should try something else. And that just made it really hard for restaurants to get their, their employees. So uh, we tried to buy takeout food as much as we could, uh, continue to do so. Um, I have many, many, many friends. You know, when I opened the Wine Coop Brewing Company back in 1988 as an out-of-work geologist, and our rent was $1 per square foot per year, uh, I didn't, I mean, I was just hoping, <laughs> hoping I could make the thing work. I didn't realize that it would be my, my social framework for the, the majority of my adult life and that so many of my friendships are people that I met in the restaurant industry and who I you know got to know better and better through our 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 shared businesses um, and it's just hard to see everybody going through so much hard time and we're still you know there's still money here that's going to support small businesses uh, as part of the uh, uh, the ARP money that we sent out in in January and February got that passed. Uh, is, is earmarked for small businesses. And I know Colorado is still looking at how they're going to spend those funds. Thanks, Senator. We are going to move on to our next video question. Our second one comes from Ramesh in Boulder on climate change and the budget bill. This is Ramesh from Boulder, Colorado. Am I missing that? I have the following question. Uh, how will Senator, uh, how will Senator Hickenlooper his position in various committees such as commerce, energy, natural resources, health, and small business to advance investment in climate, jobs, and justice in the $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation bill? Thank you. Um. You know, I don't even know where to start. That we could that we could take the the rest of this town hall meeting and just uh, and just go through that. Um, you know, it's interesting. Each one of my committees plays a different role. Oh, this is Ramesh from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, each one each, each one of our committees plays a different role, um, and so I'm on the Commerce Committee, uh, and uh, on that committee, I chair the subcommittee. Uh, for space and science. And in many ways, we're looking at things like the uh, the issue of pandemic preparedness. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a, you know, we're looking at on the, uh, some of these committees, well, the Commerce Committee is really more focused around small businesses and making sure that we have ways to address all those restaurants that are struggling and, 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 and fighting their way back. Um, but we, uh, we are also, uh, you know, trying to make sure that as we um, provide more resources for small business, um, you know, how do we how do we get there? Um, and so, commerce looks at some of the the issues like, like uh, making sure we have resources to uh, rebuild the electric grid, uh, provide uh, uh, recharging stations for electric vehicles, um, making sure that we, you know, eventually we're looking at investing in things like carbon capture and uh, other solutions as well. Um, and I think that uh, all of those things on the on that on the Commerce Committee 
kind of lean towards or at least push me towards a, a sense that we should have figure out some putting a price on carbon emissions or, or, or value on what that what that pollution costs us and and what we should be spending to to fight climate climate change uh, on the health committee where well, I started to get my two committees views, but the health education labor and pensions committee they call it the health committee uh, that's where we've been looking at pandemic preparedness and we were lucky that with COVID-19, we were prepared. We'd done for several years. Um, President Obama had started uh, a process of making sure we had research uh, into these, uh, into COVID-19 in case there was a, a pandemic. So that, that allowed us to get a vaccine within 340 days, which is amazing. Uh, I mean, really unheard of. <clears throat> and yet uh, the new, uh, executive director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Affairs. It's a guy named Eric Lander, and he's helped work with a whole group of people to create a very detailed plan where we look at all the, I think there are 25 or 26 families of viruses that could be connected to a pandemic. And that now is the time to invest, you know, several billion dollars a year, you know, seven, six, seven, eight billion dollars a year to build up a library of, of the building blocks that we would need to make a vaccine for a, a pandemic type virus that came, or, or an infection that came through one of these virus families. Uh, and it's one of those things, you know, the, the estimates are that we've we spent about 16, it caught, the cost of this last pandemic is about $16 trillion. Um, Dr. Lander thinks that, that on an average year, over a hundred years, <clears throat> we know we're gonna get a handful of pandemics that appears for many reasons, like we're gonna, they're, they're becoming more frequent as the space that where animals, wild animals and, and humans are separated, they're, they're more and more in contact, which is one of the delineations of how you get more of these pandemics. Uh, but there is a, a, a real belief that we could spend 400, $500 billion a year on average in all the associated costs of the pandemics we get, whereas for, you know, five, six, seven, six, seven, eight, uh, let's say five, six, seven billion dollars a year for four to six years, uh, we could build a library that would protect us against that. So that's also in, in uh, that's also in the, uh, the health education labor part. That's also where we're also looking at, at the workforce training and some of the uh, abilities to look at uh, child care, early childhood education, uh, community colleges to make sure that as we make these infrastructure investments and address climate change, we have the workforce to do that and that we have the support for for that workforce, the, the, the you know, childcare and the things that, uh, especially for women that they need uh, to go out and work. Um, I also uh, look at, I'm on the small business committee, which is really a wonderful place. The, the, the chair is uh, Senator Ben Cardin from Maryland. Um, and he and I build up a, a great relationship, really looking at the truly small businesses. You know, over a million people in Colorado work in small businesses. It's a it's a big chunk of our of our economy, and and they got hit harder than anybody from from COVID. So that small business committee is a a, a big part of what we're uh, looking at as well as we try to you know push back uh, from the, the the pandemic, but also. Uh, addressing climate change as we go forward. Got it. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, the next question is from Noah in Golden on broadband. Many parts of rural Colorado have no broadband internet uh, services available, even in the nearby foothills, less than a 30 minute drive from Denver. How will you bring broadband, a utility of modern living, to rural Colorado? So we've been working on that for, you know, right, I, I when I first started as governor, we started allocating resources and, you know, we've made a lot of progress, but as, as pretty much anybody in rural Colorado knows, we're not there yet. Uh, we've got a long way to go. And I think the best model is to look at what this country did a hundred years ago with rural electrification. Uh, we made a decision as a country that having electricity to your home was too critical to allow it just to be, you know, for people in the cities. And clearly it was a lot more expensive to run power lines out to our smaller towns and out to those rural farms 
you know, well beyond the town limits. But but we believe that this was a shared value that every community and every farmhouse, every ranch house had to have uh, electricity, and we did it. It took twenty some years, but we did it. Uh, now we've got to do the same thing with broadband because broadband is no less important. Um, and I think that that connection uh, to the internet is you know is part of of being able to. Uh, compete in, in the modern world as part of being connected to the modern world. Um, anyway, I think that we are hopeful uh, that the, the broadband funding that is uh, uh, that was committed in infrastructure, $65 billion, that should get us a long way towards that goal. Uh, but we're also looking at things to have um, uh, money to uh, people that have don't have the 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 money uh you know to pay the monthly what the monthly cost is for broad um, and the affordability connect, connectivity benefit is something that i think is going to affect 22 percent of our of our state probably you know over 1.2 million people and that's in addition to the 65 billion dollars which is really just investing in the infrastructure so in colorado we'll get about 65 billion dollars we'll get uh, I think I said this earlier. If I if I start repeating myself, you guys can just all raise your hands. I guess you can't do that, but uh, we should get a minimum of a hundred million dollars just in Colorado of of that uh, of that broadband commitment. I think it hopefully it will be closer to 120 or 130 million dollars, and that that should that along with the the resources to provide affordability uh, should be a gigantic step. Um, and I you know the when I went around the state uh, a year and a half ago, went to some of the smaller towns in the mountains, some of these little towns up at Box Canyon, and we actually had to subsidize, uh, making sure that they got fiber optics all the way up into their little town. But what a difference it made, not just not just to the individuals in their daily lives, but to the, to the mindset, the confidence that that whole community had. Uh, and I think we wanna make sure that every, every town, every county in Colorado, Every every person in Colorado has that connectivity, so that they can all have that sense of of self reliance, uh, and that they are they are ready to to engage the modern world in whatever the, in whatever way they want. Thanks so much, Senator. Our uh, next question comes from Jessica Fishman. Uh, I don't know if it totally counts as a question because it's uh, concluded with about six exclamation marks, but voting rights. What do you think? Ah, voting rights. Um, you know, this is a, a terrifically difficult question for a lot of us in Colorado because we spend so much time creating the model for best practices in, in, in how you have safe, secure elections where you make sure everything, every vote is counted. Uh, we have uh, statistically accurate audits going on during the election so we can go back uh, there's a paper ballot and a backup, uh, you know, and I, some people say, well, Democrats don't want to have, don't want to allow people to have to produce some sort of identification. That's not me. I think everyone should have to produce some sort of identification. Uh, maybe that identification is where they're paying their, their, it's their water bill or their electric bill for their, where they live. I mean, there are a number of different types of identification we accept in Colorado, but everybody provides uh, uh, identification. Uh, I think what's going on right now um, is is troubling because we see what are fairly transparent attempts to disenfranchise large numbers of voters, largely because because they are likely to vote for a Democratic candidate, and. I've, again, never seen this at this scale uh, in my lifetime. And I think, I, I, I mean, this is the fundamental bedrock of, of democracy. Uh, and the um, voting rights acts that have been out there, and a lot was made that Joe Manchin, a lot of people talked about, he was resistant to the original, um, the, the original bill coming over from the House. Um, but when he delivered what he thought his key ingredients were, it was pretty straightforward. And I think if we were able to, to do the, the John Lewis 
uh, Voting Rights Act, if we were able to piece together some of these uh, different bills and really focus on making sure that we have election systems that people can't cheat, uh, and yet everybody is encouraged to vote. Uh, I mean, I, so far we haven't been able to get too much Republican support, but I just am really stymied by that. Uh, and obviously the, the question that we get asked every day, and I've been asked, oh my gosh, a hundred times during the campaign, uh, was, well, what happens if, if you can't get something like voting rights protected uh, and you can't get 10 Republican votes, you can't get 60 votes, what happens then? And I think then you have to look at, you know, why it is and, and, and make sure that we've done everything we can to hear what their real concerns are. I, I always point out to people that Colorado's voting system was bipartisan. Uh, it was made up by, of, of county clerks from across the state, uh, the majority of them Republicans, uh, who all felt that making sure that everybody voted is a crucial part of democracy. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, that's something that we should uh, not lose sight of. Uh, so anyway, if, if, if we cannot find 60 votes just for the most basic protections, you know, I guess then we have to look at beginning to change some of the, you know, the, like the filibuster and, and how can we adjust that in such a way. I mean, you certainly don't want to have make major changes. And then two years or four years later, when you know control of one of the, or both of the houses switches, and maybe the White House switches, you don't want to be swinging back and forth like a pendulum. So I do think it's very important that we do everything we possibly can to try and get uh, that bipartisan effort to get it done. And again, you know, when we when we did our all mail ballot, and for the life of me, I can't see why the federal government doesn't pay for all that postage and. And, and and provide the resources so that everybody can do an all mail ballot because then you get past a lot of the issues that, that people are fighting over in Georgia and Arizona and, uh, and Texas. Uh, you just make sure that that everyone's voting. Uh, anyway, uh, if we can't get to that bipartisan uh, magical sixty vote total, uh, then we have to we have to look at everything. And I've said this even back to when I was running during the election that. Uh, if we have to somehow modify or change the filibuster, then then we probably should do it. Um, when we changed our voting rights or our voting rights, we changed our, our voting system. I mean, not only was it a, a safer, more secure election, but our turnout went up nine percent. That's what we should. That's what every state should want to do. Not have your turnout go down. So anyway, uh, I know that's not a it's not an easy answer. And it's it's a difficult issue. I will tell you that the, that voting rights will be. You know, we'll we'll go back and deal with reconciliation in the budget, uh, but voting rights will be right front and center, right from the moment we get back there. People will be working on trying to figure out what is the, uh, is there anything we can possibly do to get a bipartisan solution that that protects everybody's right to vote. Well said, thank you, Senator. Um, the next question comes from Emma in Denver. Um, she asks, Have you fully recovered from COVID, and are you feeling any better? Um, well, thank you, Emma. And, I, and I can't tell you again, I, I said this at the beginning and I want to uh, say it again. The, the number of people who reached out and, and wanted to hear how um, Helen and I uh, were doing, it just meant a lot. Um, and it, it's funny, you don't think, I mean, we wore our masks everywhere. We were, I think, as careful as, as you can be. And, you know, I'd had a, I'd had a cold for about 10 weeks. So I didn't, until I actually lost my sense of taste, which was, um, it'll be two weeks ago tomorrow. Um, and I had a little scoop of ice cream. I was with some of my cousins and my family. Uh, and Teddy was there with a couple of his friends. And there was coffee ice cream, which is my favorite ice cream in the world. And I suddenly realized I couldn't taste it. And just like in a in a flash, I, I said, I think I must have COVID. And, and Robin had just started getting a real cough. And so we went and got a couple of those rapid tests uh, the next day, the next morning. Uh, and sure enough, we both tested positive. We couldn't believe it. 
because we've been so careful. And none of the other people, we were all uh, uh, hanging out with family members for, for that week. And no one else, uh, well, actually Robin's mother came and, 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 and she had a very mild case as well, but nobody else tested uh, positive at all. Uh, and we had, as I said in the beginning, very mild cases, um, you know, uh, uh, some coughs. Uh, Robin had a, a fever uh, for a couple of nights. I, th there were a couple of days there where I was so tired. If I got up and did anything for an hour, I'd have to sit down just to kind of re <laughs> uh, regain my strength a little bit. It sounds silly, um, but that's what it does to you. Uh, we're both hopeful that we don't have, we won't have, you know, some of these cases you can you can go on feeling weak for four or five, six weeks. But I don't think we're going to have that. I, I think it is uh, crucially important that that people do get vaccinated. And uh, it, this is a free country. I'm not someone who thinks we should go and force everyone to get vaccinated. But you hear the stories of people of all ages who are not happens to them when they catch this Delta variant and how serious it is, in many cases, fatal. And you just, I wish there was some way we could, you know, rebuild people's trust. I don't know whether it's a distrust in science or a distrust in government. Um, a, a friend of mine that I talked to yesterday uh, has a daughter who, you know, went to school in Boston. She went to Tufts. She got a master's from Tufts. And she won't get vaccinated. And originally, it was because it wasn't FDA approved, and then there was another issue about whether it was, um, you know, that there was something, you know, some uh, crazy th thing that someone was trying to listen in. These these demonstrations of distrust that people have for for government and for science are are coming at the worst time. This is when. We can't be divided on things like vaccines. We, we, we need to come together. We need to be one. Uh, one of the great things about a democracy is usually when you have a natural disaster like COVID-19 was and has been, the whole country comes together and unites around what are the best solutions for this. And you know that's what they did for polio. And there were some people, but a much, much smaller number of people that didn't want to get polio vaccines. And it took a few years but eventually the country came together. And I do hope in terms of, of preparing for future pandemics and rebuilding and dealing with climate change, that we can begin finding ways to, to pull us together uh, rather than always seeing the path that divides us. It's part of why I was so uh, grateful to be included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, just because it, it allowed me to, to to work on, you know, how do you how do you build relationships with people so that they, you know, they may not agree with you, but they respect your opinion and you respect their opinion, and and that respect allows you to to collaborate, right? And 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 you only can get there with with trust. You've got to have some some level of trust. We used to say when I was in the governor's office that that we collaborate at the speed of trust, um, and that's that's what this country is going to have to do. We got a lot of big important decisions to make about all manner of issues and we just can't have it be us as them in our own country uh we can't we can't afford that luxury thanks senator uh, i think our next question is another video question from elizabeth who will be asking her question in both spanish and english buenas tardes mi nombre es elizabeth y esta es mi pregunta para el senador Para nuestro futuro, no solo necesitamos carreteras y puentes. Nuestras familias necesitan tiempo apagado, atención médica, viviendas alcanzables y acceso a cuidado de niños. Muchos de nosotros hemos pasado tanto tiempo sin estas necesidades, mientras que las personas más ricas y las corporaciones grandes siguen recibiendo más y más dinero cada vez y pagando menos en impuestos. Mis padres son inmigrantes y yo me acabo de graduar de la universidad. Nosotros pagamos nuestros impuestos. Senador, ¿se va a asegurar de que las más ricas y las corporaciones grandes paguen su parte justa también para que podamos proveer para los residentes de Colorado como yo? Gracias. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and this is my question for the senator. For our future, we don't just need roads and bridges. Our families need paid leave, health care, attainable housing, and child care. So many of us have gone without for so long, while the richest people and big corporations keep getting more and more while paying less and less in taxes. 
My parents are immigrants, and I just graduated college. We pay our taxes. Senator, will you make sure that the wealthiest people and the biggest corporations pay their fair share too, so we can provide for regular Coloradoans like me? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and uh, I was going to try and answer in Spanish, but I don't think I think that would take another half an hour, and I'm not sure anyone would stand for it. Um, I think it's been a question for a long time of how do we make sure everybody pays their fair share? And I think it's probably going to be a lot of different places. We're going to, uh, my guess is raise corporate taxes and close a bunch of loopholes. We, we're going to try and make the system more fair, which I think is what you're, what you're getting at. Um, our, our budget bill and this reconciliation is going to be a, a, a significant investment in the middle class and is, is going to allow people who can't afford childcare to finally afford it. They're going to get qu high quality early childhood education for every kid. Um, we're going to be able to make sure that we have, have uh, people who want to learning skills and community college. They'll be able to, uh, I think we'll be ma making some of the largest investments against, uh, against climate change uh, in history ever, anywhere in the world. Um, and I think that, you know, these investments in, in climate change, in, you know, in, in child care and education and, and care providers, I mean, these are all investments in the middle class. Uh, and I think that, you know, this will include a, a, a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. Um, there's going to be a, uh, an ability to extend that child tax credit, which Michael Bennett worked on so hard, reduced uh, uh, child poverty by uh, 50 percent um it help us prepare for the next pandemic as i was just saying <clears throat> make sure that we have family leave uh, other support for working families this is the time <clears throat> we got to come back from this pandemic and this is the time to give the middle class a real the, the support they need to be able to compete fairly for the for the good jobs of tomorrow and and i think we'll get it done it's going to be a it's going to be a battle but we'll get it done thanks senator so much um I'll let you close up the town hall in just a moment, but want to let folks know um, that we apologize. We're out of time this evening. Um, hope you enjoyed uh, the past hour of conversation here with Senator Hickenlooper, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and participated, um, and especially to everyone who submitted questions. Um, we had more than 1,000 questions come through and submitted ahead of this town hall, and so uh, even more came in tonight throughout the entire hour. So we're sorry that we weren't able to get to everybody, but please continue to reach out to our office. Uh, with what's on your mind. And, you know, Senator, as we close out here, it's been a tough year and a half for a lot of folks. Uh, and sometimes it can feel overwhelming out there in the world. And I think everybody appreciates your optimism uh, throughout your time in public service in Colorado. And we'd just love if uh, maybe you could leave us off with a hopeful note on how you think things are going to go in the next uh, couple of years. Well, I think it's not going to be easy. I mean, this pandemic has has been a heavy blow to people in this country, but especially working people. Uh, and what we're going to do in the next couple months, hopefully, we'll build the foundation that will allow us to to expand the middle class of what like what used to happen in my childhood, uh, where this country invested in the in the middle class and made sure that the that the education and the skills and the resources and the support was adequate to allow people that were willing to to work hard to to get a benefit, to be able to afford a decent place to live, to have a vacation, to have health coverage. Um, this this shouldn't be that unimaginable. And so that's what we're going to be working on in these next few months and probably over the next few years because uh, there'll be a lot of follow-up. Uh, let me tell everyone, thank you for being on tonight. This is the beginning, not the end. I look forward to continuing these. We want to be your voice in Washington and uh, we realize you're not going to make everybody happy, but we want to be open and transparent uh, in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay? Have a great night and thank you.